kinds of presentations because I know you're going to have questions. Maybe you won't have as many questions you're going to have down the road, but the mortgage is a very complex instrument. And so if you have any questions whatsoever, interrupt me and let's talk about that because I want to know what's interested or what's of interest to you. Uh, the main reason why I think we do this class, maybe on Russia's end it might be a little different than my end. On my end, as you guys are probably aware, our industries are very similar. The real estate and the mortgage industries are very similar. In that, and you guys may not realize this, this uh, similarity, you guys have heard of the Pareto Principle? You ever heard of that? It basically says that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And it's pretty true. It stands out for most industries. So in your industry, you're going to find that 20% of the end of the homes being sold are being done by the top 20% of the agents in the industry. Meaning the other 80% does 20% of the end of the work. So your goal is to become that 20%. You don't want to be stuck down on the 80%. Well, in our industry, it's the same way. But we differ in that you guys are on the front line out there finding the business. Okay, you guys are beating the streets. You find the buyers and you bring them into the whole transaction. You are the captain of the ship. Okay, you're the frontline person. So in an essence, the mortgage loan officer really works for you. They try and they try and help you accomplish your objective in closing more business. But as a good mortgage loan officer, I'm talking about the top 20%, they want to align themselves with the very best in the real estate side. That makes sense, right? I mean, if you align yourself with five really top producing real estate agents, you got a really good producing team and you make a lot of money and everything's efficient, everything works well. Well, your job as brand new, everybody in here is brand new, right? You guys are all brand new to the industry. Has anybody sold a house? Fantastic. Good. How long have you been in the business? Uh, eight months. Very good. Very good. It's, you, that first house was very exciting, so congratulations on doing that. What you want to do is align yourself with the best loan officers, right? You guys know much about what happens on the mortgage side? It's a very intricate process and there are, during the course of a transaction, there'll be 10 to 12 people who will touch your transaction. It may not appear that way, but people will be working behind the scenes. So it's a very intricate instrument that changes on a regular basis. We get notifications continually about changes to the mortgage process. So what you want to do is align yourself with the best loan officer. Well, if that best loan officer out there is trying to align themselves with the best real estate agents, you don't want to come into the industry and go, okay, I'll just align myself with the person on the low end of the mortgage industry because there's too much to know. And if you get someone who doesn't know what they're doing, you are in essence, your essence going out of the beaten street. It can take you, who knows, weeks, months to find this person to buy a house. That's your paycheck. You're now turning that paycheck over to an individual who's going to make sure it cashes. You want to make sure the person you turn that over to is competent. Okay? You really don't want to send, I mean, let's just face it, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to have your first transaction soon. You don't want the mortgage person to be in the same boat, right? You don't want that, that to be their first transaction because they can mess it up. Mortgage loans get messed up regularly. So how do you become the person who can do business with this high producing agent? Well, a high producing mortgage loan officer will gladly take your transaction. Gladly take it. They will help you. They're going to be the best person to handle the process. They know what's going on. They're going to get the deal done. The reason why they wouldn't want to work with you is if you become more problem than it's worth. So here's the, the whole emphasis of this class. If you know what to expect in the mortgage process, you can be part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Let me explain that to you a little bit better. A lot of transactions happen like this. You go out and you work your, your tail off to find this, bot, this buyer, you give them to a mortgage person, and the process starts to become clogged. And your, borrower, your buyer comes back to you and says, I don't understand why it's taking so long. They're asking for this. Why is this necessary? My friends are telling me I don't have to provide this documentation. Why is this happening? And you say, as some people go, dang that mortgage loan officer. I don't know what is wrong with them, but I'm going to call up right now and ring their neck, and I'll call exactly you know what's happening. So, in management, I've said for years, you're going to have fires. You're always going to have fires. As a manager, and you're a manager of your transaction, you can bring a can of gasoline or a can of water. If you bring gasoline, you have a huge problem on your hands. And if you join in with your buyer and say, yeah, that is, without knowing what's going on, yeah, that is clustered. I don't even know how to, I don't even know what to say. 
they've now been worked up into a froth, and you didn't bring a solution to the problem. The solution is, let's close the deal. Let's get money in our pocket. So hopefully what we do is prepare you to be able to work with your loan officer to bring resolution to the issues, because there will be issues. Now, that begs the question, what if I have a bad loan officer? Hopefully we'll be able to teach you what to look for in that too. Because if you do, it still doesn't help to build it into a bonfire, but it helps you to recognize something that was a natural consequence of the deal or ineptitude on the loan officer's part. So as we go along, you guys, you guys bought houses? Everybody's gone through that process. Was it difficult? Was it painful? A couple of yes and a couple of no's. Yeah, it could be it could be a stressful situation. I uh, I've done this for 25 years. Um, I haven't reached 10 sleepless nights yet, but I've got a high handful. Because when you have someone moving into a house and you may have messed up and they may not be buying their house, you will not sleep. You will be and I have never lost someone's house. But we've delayed it, so um, the issue is that hopefully you, you have enough foreknowledge to get in front of the problems and make sure they don't happen. Any questions so far? Okay, you will have some, hopefully. Okay, this is the first thing that happened. We talked about it primary, or we talked about it initially. You guys are the captain of the ship. You find the buyer, okay? You find that buyer, what do they say to you? I'm, a, I'm looking to buy a house, I'm interested in buying a house, what do I do? What do you do? Very first, right out of the shoot. Pre-qualify them, 100%. You do not want to take a borrower out, write an offer on them, present the offer to a seller, and they go, yeah, that's a great offer. Can they buy? And you go, oh, I don't know. You're wasting everybody's time. Okay? So what you need to do is pre get them pre-qualified. Pre-qualification pre process looks like this. Some of these people, and as you develop your career, you're going to under have an understanding of who is really good in the mortgage industry. People are going to come to you and say, yeah, I'm pre-qualified. I'm going down to my credit. Um, I've got a friend, my uncle's doing this, and I'm going to have him do it. You m will probably want to get in the middle of that and ask a couple of questions to make sure that that person who is handling your paycheck is qualified to make sure you can get through to the end of it. Because I've taught this class many times. I do not like to uh, discredit other people doing this industry, but there are certain institutions that are very highly qualified to get your borrowers through to closing, and there are others who actually struggle to do it. Um, in a seller's market, which we're in right now, you guys know the difference between sellers and buyers markets, we're in a seller's market still, was really strong last year, we're still in it. In a seller's market, that seller is less likely to be understanding of a late closing. Right? You've got money that goes hard several weeks into the process, and they're looking at it going, you know what, I don't know what you're ever going to come through with this. You're asking me for an extension. I may not accept, I may not extend this house. You just went hard, I got your thousand dollars, I've earned money, we're just going to go find something else. That is something you do not want to happen. So you want to make sure that the person who's handling the financing knows what they're doing. The problem we have in this kind of a market is that um, Credit unions and banks don't generally have the highest qualified people to handle their transactions. I am not denigrating credit unions and banks. I'm just telling you how this industry works. The reason why that is is because credit unions and banks try and operate on the very slimmest of margins. And they will pay their employees, which is your number one cost as a business, they will pay their employees the least amount in the industry. So if you go to work for a bank, the first place you work as a, as a loan officer or as a teller or whatever it is, and you work your way up the process, soon you find out, hey, I'm pretty proficient at being a loan officer or a processor or an underwriter. I would like to make more money. Pretty standard, right? Go to your boss or whoever, they won't pay you more money because, hey, our process here is to be the very cheapest there is. And I'll be totally frank with you, banks and credit unions, on average, can have a touch a touch lower interest rate. And in a buyer's market where you've got plenty of time to work with, you know what? Go with the cheapest. When you've got to beat that deadline, you've got the cheapest rates, you also have the cheapest payroll. Correspondingly, you have the people willing to accept them. The cheapest payroll, they may not be the highest qualified. You can see I'm not, I'm not denigrating the business. I'm telling you how economics works. When they find out that they're really good at what they do, they go work for a correspondent lender or a broker or whoever pays them more money. It's just simple economics. 
what that leaves them with is the least qualified. So someone comes to you and says, you know what, I've been down to the local credit union and I've been pre-approved. And you're looking at a house, say it's a starter home of $250,000 in Salt Lake County, and you know that house is highly demand, in high demand. And they're going to take the offer that delivers the quickest money, aren't they? You can't go and ask for a 45 day closing because the guy standing behind you has a 30 day, they're going to take the 30 day. Well, your client says, I'm pre approved at the credit union or the bank. You may want to ask a few questions. And that's what we're going to go through today is how to figure out whether you have someone who's confident to get your deal done or not. So, the questions that we're going to teach you is basically the premise of our class here. So, what happens in this process? They come to you and say, oh, I want to buy a house. Have you been pre approved? You ask, they say yes. You ask them where, who, how much. You might even want to go as far as asking for, let me jump ahead just a little bit. We're going to write a pre approval letter. Every, you know, when a borrower comes in, we go through the whole process and write a pre approval letter. That pre approval letter is worth how much? They may know. Not even the paper it's written on. Okay? No one has ever been sued on a pre approval letter. It basically states they've been pre approved, we've gone through the process. But if they should happen to do any of these other things, where do we rescind our pre approval? So, yeah. Is that the same thing as like uh, verified funds, the pre approval letter? Or is that the verified funds are part of the pre approval. Okay. okay. It's like a percentage rate, usually. Like what 20%. Part? Uh, yeah, it, and there are the, the loan programs that will determine what down payment they need are varied. I mean, you can go from, yeah, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. The pre-approval letter, I want to tell you, it means nothing. Um, but sellers want to make sure you've gone through the process. Now, the value in that pre-approval letter is in the letterhead at the top of the letter. Okay, if you've never heard of this company and they don't have a reputation of delivering, you may want to go a little bit farther into the process and find out you've got something that's that's going to last. Part of our getting that pre-approval letter is we're going to meet with the client. I think I jumped ahead a little bit. You're going to make sure that you feel comfortable about that pre-approval letter. Because if you don't, you would say to them, let me have you talk to my lender. This is someone I trust. We've been through the fire together. I know what they do when it gets heated. I know how to that they, they're someone I trust, would you mind having a competing offer? If they have no one in stow, you say, let me have you talk to my lender. Now, you would have a lender because you've gone through the fire with them. I promise you, if you do 10 loans or, or 10 purchases and there are 10 loans associated with them, I promise you three or four of them are going to have fires. And they may feel pretty hot. It's just the nature of it. Um, we're dealing with people who people try verbally, they describe a situation, their financial situation that really never bears out. You know, people always like to round up, like I say. So um, you're going to want to make sure that when you that when we go through that process that they've gone through the, the vetting. So look at the name. This is someone we trust. Um, the process of putting that pre approval in, in place is this. You will direct them to your lender, or if you don't have a lender, suggest someone, maybe an industry, you know, go with someone to trust that you trust. Someone who's been around for a long time is obviously going to stand behind their, their business and try not to leave you hand, hanging. One of the things being leave you hanging, let's say that a closing doesn't happen on time, what do we do? This happens all the time. The borrower doesn't realize that we're having issues on the back end of their file. A lot of loan officers are not really good at telling them that things are going a little bit slower than they thought or that they have issues that they didn't anticipate. They, what do they do? I'm supposed to close on the 30th. I round up all my friends, rent a moving truck, and we're going to move on the 30th. You call them on the 29th and say, we have a little bit of an issue. I need a couple of days. Hopefully that doesn't happen, but I'm here to tell you it does. What happens? Well, they have a moving van. They're out of their house. They're moving out of their apartment. It's going to be rented out. There are issues involved. So one of the things a good mortgage company will do will make that right. And that is an issue in my time in this industry. I have written checks for hotel rooms or moving companies or paid for lost interest. That's how you do it. If you do not have a lender who will stand behind you, and that's why I say a company that you've heard of before is generally not going to say tough luck. Someone you've never heard of, and the things get hot, they're going to say, sorry, I don't have a reputation to stand behind. I don't have to worry about you smirching my name. Tough. Didn't happen. 
And that happens. I hate to tell you, but that happens. Tough. I wish I could help you. And then they stop taking your phone call. So you want to make sure that when things get tough, because I would be lying to you to say, get a good loan officer and you'll never have a problem. That's not true. You will have problems because this is a very, very difficult business. You guys are familiar with the mortgage crisis of about 2007, 2008, revolutionized our industry. I like to tell clients, it's kind of our 9-11. Our Most of you remember flying before 9-11? Can any of you remember falling to the curb, running down to the gate, kissing your family goodbye, and come back, your car's still there? You can't do that now. They're gonna take a picture of you naked like this. That's what's happened to our industry. It used to be, we didn't verify anything. You say you do this, okay, pull your credit, do an appraisal, we're going to pull your deal. Now, we're going to triple verify every single thing you tell us. Every single thing you tell us is triple verified. So, we've gone through a revolution of sorts, and this is going to be a very trying experience for these people. It's uh, mostly about a car, right? You know what they do? Some of them will call your employer and say, do they work there? Yeah, okay, good. We're not like that at all. Very, very difficult. So part of the process of getting someone ready to buy a house, we will bring them in and we'll sit down and this, this is what we do. First and foremost, we're gonna do what? Anybody know what we do? What's the most important thing in buying a house? Credit. Very good, you've done one house, you know the answer. Two houses. Two houses, very good. Yeah, we're gonna pull their credit, why? I was in this industry before we had credit scores. And I've been here for a long time. We didn't used to have credit scores, but the credit score now is such a reliable indicator of a person's ability to do almost anything. Employers are now looking for that. Insurance companies pull your credit report. Anybody who has to rely upon your integrity is pulling your credit report because it's been proven to be a fairly reliable instrument. There are things that we can do. Um, in fact, this is this is a huge tool for you because you will run into people who say, yeah, I am looking to buy a house, but I'm probably six, nine, 12 months out. Um, you would ask them, have you been pre-approved yet? Well, no, but we'll do that when we get around to it. We bought a car last month, we'll, we'll be fine. The truth of the matter is it's not just hitting a benchmark to get your, your mortgage in place, uh, which is about 620. There, there are scores beneath that that you can pull some strings, so a lot of work to get done, but the benchmark's about 620. But it isn't just when you hit 620 on your FICO score. You guys are all familiar with FICO scores. And by the way, there's three scores, and we use the middle of the lowest borrower. Okay, that's how that works. It's not just hitting that 620 benchmark. It's for a conventional loan, every 20 points above that is a better interest rate, up to about 760. The highest score could be potentially 850. So someone might come to you and say, you know what, I'm good, everything's fine, I bought a car, we're all good. Your ability to help them get off the fence a little bit or help them become in, become your client, a pipeline we talk about for future business, is to get them to say, look, I understand that you've gone through the process, you bought a car, whatever. The reality is that there are many people who require just a little bit more work than is necessary in order for you to buy a house. And if we find the house you want, we have 30 days to close. You may not have the time to do any kind of repair to your credit in 30 days. In fact, you really won't. So if someone has not been pre-approved, you're asked talking to someone and say, I'm not ready to buy, I'll buy down the road. It's a great way to get them in your court. Let's go through that step now because if it does require any kind of fixing to your credit, we want to have the time to do it without a gun held in our head. We want to be able to do that prior to, to, to finding our house. So they might want to come, and, and there are so many things that can be done for someone's credit. We actually do a thing called Credit Atlas. It's a, it's a software that, that reads their, their um, credit and determines there are certain things that they can do so that their, their credit score can improve. Um, credit scores are actually, they're, they're proprietary in that these three credit reporting agencies have developed these credit algorithms that determine what your credit score is. They didn't use any kind of, they just got together and said, hey, this is what we think it is. And there were three companies that did it, and they convinced us, as the American people, that they have relevance. Well, when you convince someone they have relevance, eventually they do. But what they will not do, because if they were to tell us what those algorithms look like, in other words, how your credit is determined, then everybody would know how to manipulate the system. They will not tell us. 
I mean, for 20 years we've been doing credit scores. They will not tell us how that works. But we have we've seen uh, trends and propensities. So we can we can kind of get an idea if we do this, we will get that. We will run a credit analyst on these people and say, look, if you do these certain things, we can actually get your credit score up a little bit higher. And it's as simple as this. And, and people don't, a lot of lenders are kind of lazy. You know, if you get someone comes in and they have a 665 credit score, okay, remember they're in 20 point increments. If they get to 680, they get a better, they get a better underwrite, they get a better interest rate. You know what it takes to move someone's credit score 15 points? Almost nothing. Almost nothing. You can look at someone's credit report and go, okay, you have a Mervyn's card, a thousand dollar limit, and you're above 60% of that thousand dollars. If we take that below 60%, you just jump 15 points. Is that valuable? Yeah, you give them a better interest rate. And it took what? Maybe $200? But a lot of lenders won't do that because I can get you done at 665. Yeah, you got a higher interest rate. What do I care? You want your borrowers to get the very best service they possibly can. And if you are perceived as being the expert in that, they will align with you and they will refer you. So it's best that you know these things because I'm telling you, a lot of lenders, that's just too much work. I don't want to do it. You gave me the contract. I have three weeks. I'm not going to get in the middle of that. Um, the process of getting that to increase also is they have to go in, pay it down $200. Then you could wait for the cycle to come around again. That could be 45 days. But we can do what's called a rapid rescore, but that costs like a hundred bucks. Well, I have to pay that. I can't make you pay it. I can't legally make you pay that. So a lot of lenders go, oh well, we don't have time. I'm not paying the money. This is your credit score. You want someone who's interested in getting your borrowers the very best deal. Okay, so that's one of the things you're going to look for. But that's what we do. First thing is we pull their credit. Um, and you definitely want to push them to get that done as soon as possible. You do not want to wait on pulling your credit because it is that tied. In fact, even beyond uh, conventional interest rates being tied to that, those 20 point increments, even beyond that, there are programs that you just flat cannot have if you don't have certain credit scores. Utah Housing, you guys all have heard of Utah Housing. Great program for people with no money now. Unfortunately, if you don't have at least a 660 FICO score, your ability to borrow the entire amount, including closing costs, is diminished greatly by about 2% of the purchase price, just because you didn't have a 660. A lazy borrower would say, I can get your deal done. You just got to go for a little bit more money. Someone who cares about your clients would say, let's do what we can to increase your credit score and give you the better loan. So, so I have a lot of questions. So you ask those um, questions. So, it's, so lenders are usually supposed to coach the borrowers on their credit score. Or yes. do they refer them to like a credit repair? Because I, my friend right now, she's she won't work with me. I don't know why, but her lender will coach her. She's on Facebook saying, "How do I raise my credit score?" I'm like, "Your lender should be." They should be doing that. So that's the norm. Um, I will tell you, in relation to credit repair companies, um, we are, we are very leery to send someone to one of them okay. because they they have not proven themselves to be reliable. They generally want to tap you into a monthly payment, which is contractually guaranteed for six months and they tell you if you do these things you'll have a higher credit score if you have a good loan officer who knows credit they will actually advise them they'll run the they'll run the credit repair analysis and it costs a little bit of money to do that mm -hmm. but someone who's lazy won't do it they still want to they don't want to spend the money they don't want to go through the time well it's also advising them what not to do yes once they that's the worst thing 100 percent tell them what not to do there, here again, it comes back to if you haven't done this work prior to having that contract in place, they don't want to. They don't want to slow it down. So they may just go, ah, you know what? That's what it is. Well, it doesn't take a lot of effort to just look at someone's. We just know this, okay? If you're above sixty percent on the ratio of your available credit to what you have out, that's the benchmark. Sixty percent. Once it goes back sixty percent, it drops your credit score. It can be fairly significant depending on the size of the line of credit. Why wouldn't you just go in and do that? I'll tell you why they don't. You gave me 30 days to close this. I don't have 30 days to fix your credit. I don't have 30 days. I mean, if I'm a responsible lender, I'm going to pay $100 and tell you to go put $200 down on that, pay $100 for the rapid rescore, and have it in time to close your deal and give you a better deal. But what if I'm not a responsible loan officer? You don't know the difference. Hey, we got it done. 
So you need to understand these processes. And the way you can be helpful in this is you can ask your borrower, do you mind telling me what your credit score is? Has your borrower discussed any ways to improve that score? Because if you're below 740, really, 760 is the very top. If you're below 740 and you're doing a conventional loan, you just got to get your, your interest rate. Did your, bar, did your lender discuss ways in which you can increase that credit score? What this does separates you from your competition because you become a consultant in the process of buying the house. Then when they buy their house, they finish with you, they have a wonderful experience, your best route to further, further transactions is with the people you just closed. They're the ones who are going to make you money. Okay, Getting that new borrower is, is 10 times harder than that person selling, telling their relative, hey, this person is fantastic. Go and talk to them. And the reason that that's how you separate yourself. Become a consultant, not a salesperson. Become a consultant. So, um, I think that we did. Do you have any questions on credit? I think I covered. We're going to pull that. We're going to pull that credit report. Very first thing we do. In fact, what we try and do is pull that credit before they even come into the office, because unfortunately, we pull a lot of credit that's 550, 580. And at that point, it's not the application that we're going to do. We're going to do some advising. Um, and if they really worked hard to get to 550, meaning they spent their life not paying their bills and getting collection stuff, uh, the advice is going to be, you need to, you need to straighten up. You need to go out and establish yourself, go get some credit. But we're not, we're probably going to advise you as a real estate agent. I wouldn't spend a lot of time with them. Maybe put them in your, in your uh, reminder to call them in a year. But, if they spent their lifetime getting to that point. So that's what we're gonna do first and foremost. If they don't pass that with that asset test, we're not moving forward with them. But if we pull the credit before they come in, then we schedule an appointment where they come into the office because we want to meet with them. See the whites of their eyes is the number one way to keep to retain loyal clients. Um, in our industry, we have a hard time with people leaving even two weeks before the transaction. You know, what happens when you buy a house? You go to work, hey, we're buying a house, really? Who's using your financing? So and so. Well, our financing was done over here. It was a breeze. Well, maybe theirs is a little bit harder, but maybe they're a harder borrower. Two weeks in, they go, you know what? You asked me for this, this document. I really don't want to do that. I'm going over here. That's not good for you guys, by the way, because someone else closing that in two weeks is probably not going to happen. But it does happen. So we're trying to actually create a bond with them, meaning that we, you want to meet with them. And you would like your loan officer to meet with them, if at all possible. If they're not close by, it's not going to happen. When they come in, we're going to ask them to bring a very standard set of documentation. Let me know what that is. Pretty standard. It's the 222. Two years tax returns with the company W-2s and all schedules. Some people have very complicated tax returns. You guys know that they changed the tax return this year. Have you guys seen it? Yeah, the 1040 doesn't look the same anymore. I've not seen it yet. I filed. I e filed. Is it horrible? Well, there's like ten lines, yeah. and you have to go to schedule one, schedule two, schedule three, right. like fourteen schedules, and we don't know what schedule to go to. That's how our government operates. Once you get used to something, they change yeah. it, so you don't know how to do it anymore. It was really simple before to see the schedules, and we have to have all the schedules. If there's, if there's, if they file a schedule E or C or B or whatever it was, we have to have it. We have to have that in W two if they did it. If not, they have ten ninety nine or. You know, they own a business, we have to have business tax returns. We need to see um, two current pay stubs. Not everybody has pay stubs, they're self-employed, but they have to be most two current pay stubs with year-to-date earnings on them. And then we're going to need two, uh, two periods of bank statements. Some people get quarterly, others are month to month. We ask them to bring those in, we'll take the application, fill in all the gaps, we'll take, uh, uh, we'll take a full application based upon the information they provide us. And with that, we'll have pulled the credit. Then we'll run what's called an AUS. It's an automated underwriting system. And there are probably uh, five or six different, depends on what kind of loan program you're going to do, but it's a computer program that just basically takes all their data, runs it through their system, and says, here's the thing we're concerned about. Here's the reasons why we're going to give you an approval or a denial, and it'll spit out a conditional approval. And this is where you can, if you're really leery, about, I'll tell you something the lenders hate. Someone who doesn't trust my, I write a, I write a letter of commitment, a pre-approval letter, and someone, I have a real estate agent call and says, okay, that's great, but I wanna ask you a few questions. We hate that, because it's questioning your integrity. And I didn't deserve that. Well, the industry does. 
So you may say, um, and you know, you don't have to do this on every deal, but you, if you have suspicions that maybe they really aren't qualified, or it's one of those issues that, yeah, they say they're qualified, and three weeks from now it's actually going to fall apart, you might want to call your lender and say, okay, did you run it anyways? Did you run the automated underwriting? Um, are there any issues on there that you feel like, because they're not going to tell you what's on there. Um, the borrower really doesn't want that information to pass down. We really can't. But you can ask them, are there any issues on there whatsoever that you're concerned about? And as a responsible loan officer, they should tell you, yeah, you know what? We really need for this program, we need $20,000 down. They have 18 right now, but we're working on getting some gifted money from a relative, but that's what we're dealing with. Okay, now you as a real estate agent know what you're dealing with. Rather than just sitting back blindly going, I'll put closes in 30 days, you can work with your bars. Hey, did you guys have any issues getting that money? Is there anything I can do to help you? Are we looking okay to get that? Because you don't want to three weeks later all of a sudden, hey, we don't have enough money. You can be a part of that solution. You brought a can of water instead of gasoline. So it's not, it's not out of the realm of, of expectation for you to say, okay, you wrote me a pre-approval letter. Did you base that upon an automated underwriting system? And how does that work? And if someone says, and if you're a responsible loan officer, you will 100% tell that real estate agent. 100%. If I have a sketchy bar on my hand, I'm going to prep that agent on the very front end. Yes, here's what I have. I do have an approval in place, but here's a couple of areas of concern, and I want you to know about this because you and I are partners, and if we fail, we fail together. So I'm going to tell you. No, I'm just... Oh, I, okay. I'm going to tell you because I don't like surprises. I like partnerships. So I want you to understand this is the difficulty that I fear in this file. I've been doing it for a long time, and I see trends. So here's what I'm concerned about, and I want you to be aware of it, and I want you to be my partner in finding a resolution to get this, to get us to a closing. So someone who just comes along, they, they're, they're annoyed by your phone call, I go, yeah, we're good, don't call me. I mean, they don't say that, but you can feel that in their voice. I don't like that. I, I want partnerships. I want people who says, I'm involved in your process, let's get through it. I have a friend who's a broker of a company, and he's been doing this long enough. That he'll call me up and go, hey, do you have this? Do you have this? Today? And I go, yes, I have. I mean, he, he's, he's so good at it that I have to go through the whole process with him every time. But he knows what to look for. Yeah, I, I'm, I'll be totally honest with you. It's a little annoying. But it's his paycheck. He has a right to ask me that. He has a right to know, hey, I've been down this path, and, and these things fall apart. Have you gone through the process and verified it? Yeah, I've gone through the process. It's not bad to ask that because you do not want to get to the end of this thing and not close. And I will tell you, in the real estate profession, sometimes, this may not be you guys, but sometimes that paycheck is so important, you're going to stand on the desk over here waiting for them to write the check for you because i got to have it right now. That's life and death. And you just gave it to somebody that you don't, don't know, don't trust, don't. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with asking those kind of questions. So hopefully we give you some of those questions asked. So we, we pull that, we get the automated underwriting approval based upon those things, and we look at that. Now, you can go one step farther than the automated approval if you are concerned about some of the areas, and probably 50% of the deals, we're concerned. Yeah, I got an automated approval, but I don't know that they're going to be able to verify everything we told the system. You can actually send, send that documentation and have it um, underwritten by a, a person. Um, we actually, at our company, we have what's called a, a CNI committee, it's credit and income. And anytime you're very concerned about income can be interpreted, I mean, honestly, we can have four people look at income and the four of us give diff four different answers. So we can send that into credit and income committee on the front end. And what will happen with that committee is they'll come that as the committee, they'll decide this is what we determine the income to be. And it won't change. We can go back to them later and say, no, 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 here's what we have. We're going to go by that income because you said that's what it was. I'm going to by that. So, if they don't trust that automated underwrite, they can they can elevate it one more step and have a real person look at it. At that point, we're going to write you the commitment letter. Okay, and like I say, those commitments aren't, aren't worth a lot of it. In fact, the, the name at the top should give you a level of comfort. If someone who's been in the business for a while, they actually stand behind their work. They're not going to let someone fall by the wayside. Um, our company has has 
written checks for earnest money. Because quite frankly, you guys write a contingency in there that says, uh, I want to know on this date whether or not you have the financing and appraisal done. And we get past that date, your money went hard. Meaning that the seller can keep it. And if we make a mistake on that, and honestly it happens, well, you got to write that check. But you don't have to legally write that check. You have a moral obligation to write that check. Another reason why you want to make sure the people you're dealing with are going to stand behind you. I have a question. Yeah. I worked for a developer who was before the you know, 2007 thing, and we had a lender that was notorious for breaking deals apart. You know, a week before now, the buyer has to have 10,000 more. Right. You know, things like that. And he finally wrote into his contract if you use that lender, there was a fee. Can you do that? Or is that legal anymore? Uh, yes. Builders can actually guide and direct all they want. Real estate agents can't. Okay, that's what he was. Well, yeah. yeah. Okay. And that still is in place. A builder can say, you will use this lender, you will use this, this title company, and I don't care what you think about it. Whereas a real estate agent can't say that. He was just saying, you can use whoever you want, except. Yeah. So he's on the other side of that coin, yeah. but he can still do that. Okay. And, you know, he's in essence blackballed them. And what are they going to do about it? Sue him? And he goes back and says, you just lost five earnest money for me. Yeah, what's, they what's your claim? They, they were Horrible. Right. It was, I would imagine they didn't stay in business very long because. No, there's some business in there. They bank. Wow. That's they weren't a mortgage. They were a bank. Yeah, they probably just think they're bigger than everybody. They don't have to. They don't have to do what you. But, you know, it, our business name is yours. All you have is your reputation. Mm -hmm. That's all you have. And you have to guard that. Otherwise, I do know people who are really good at marketing and really horrible at client relations. And they can go out and find three or four new clients a month. And those people will never use them again, but they can go out three or four the next month. It's a really hard way to do business. Well, the way that we would let clients get around it is if they were using a mortgage lender and the lender, and that was who it went that came in and then it went through that thing, they would be fine that way as long as there was a mortgage person instead of the person at the bank. Yeah. Because yeah. it was all part of it. Well, and the, and the lesson there is that you develop relationships. Mm -hmm. And you also blackball relationships. And you will blackball relationships. And you will have on occasion someone come back and go, hey, I'm using this person. Go, oof. Can I have you? You know, you want to be very careful about slandering someone's name, but you want to say, look, I would really feel comfortable if you had an, another opinion on what your financing options are. That would be the best way to word that. You really don't want to ever go out and say, that person is the worst that ever lived, and they did this and this and this, because you find yourself in a lawsuit. But you just might want to say, look, I would feel really comfortable if you had someone else take a look at it. And it's not going to hurt you because you might find you have a better deal. And if you don't get a better deal, you know you got the best one here. So what does it hurt? So it's a great way to deal with that. Where they had evidence, it would be really hard for them to come back yeah, and it was, sue them. It was, it was almost unbelievable. Yeah. They go on a the summary judgment and go, look, the evidence is clear. Yeah. Of course we're not going to use them. So anyway, you've written the letter. Now we give it back to the real estate agent. Now you go out and find a house for these people. You're going to write an offer. You're going to go through the negotiating phase, several addendums, whatever. Else. Real good point here. This happens on a regular basis. You guys write the rep seat and give it to us, okay? There might even be an addendum or two at the start, right? Because you've gone through the process of negotiating back and forth. How many times does an addendum show up two, three weeks later? It happens. Because there were things we forgot to we forgot to address in the initial negotiation. Now we're three weeks in, and it's a minor thing. We're going to take the swing set. We didn't talk about that before. It's not staying with the house. It's not a fixture. We're taking a swing set. You have an addendum for that. Okay. Who does that addendum have to go to? To your lender. We have. I had one just last week. Um, the the title company sent me an addendum. Say, hey, you've seen this, right? This addendum three, and I go. Uh, no, I have not seen that, nor have I seen one or two. And we were closing the next day. Fortunately, none of those uh, had any material uh, effect on the, on the sale. But it could. It could. So when you write that Rep C, remember that anytime you write an addendum, make sure that gets to your lender immediately. Now, I say that with a uh, Norgate field here. There are some times that something can happen on something can happen on addendum that we don't want to know about. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, you go back through the house with your borrower three weeks later, and you found some water damage that you didn't see the first time through. 
Okay. You went to the seller, say you got some water damage, let's get it fixed. They go out, hire somebody, comes in there, fixes the water damage. It's done, it's through, it's finished. Guess what happens if you tell me about it? We're going to send inspectors out. And we're going to spend a lot of money making sure that the water damage was actually taken care of. You already know it's taken care of. I can't advise you, in fact, I'm telling the camera, you have to give me that addendum. But if you do, be prepared for a lot more battles than what we originally thought. I have to protect the borrower. And in that case, I can't rely upon you to protect the borrower. Even though you did, you're a highly you're a person of high integrity. Legally, I have to protect the borrower because they're also my client. So I have to hire prof trained professionals to go out and make sure that not only did the water damage done, but there was no lasting effects of that water damage. We know what those are, right? Yeah, I cleaned up the water damage on the tile, but that water got up into, into the studs. We have mold. You see how bad this was going? So you have to determine your best way to handle that because if you get me involved, I have to tear that wall apart. Have to. And you may have fixed it. And your person that went out there may have been the highest trained professional there was. And you did the work that had to be done. And you tore that wall apart and made sure there was no mold on there. But then you sent me a addendum and said, oh, there was water damage and we fixed it. I have no choice. I have no choice. So what I'm telling you is that when you have issues that you fear might change the loanability of that property, talk to your broker. Talk to your lender. Because I'm worried that it might come and bite us later, you know? For Absolutely. And, that, and your broker's going to tell you that. You the addendum and then it doesn't, like if they have to give up the house to the bank and then... I don't know. Just okay, so you want to know what I can say for the camera. You know how I handle that? <laughs> uh, we've got some water damage. Let's call the lender. Lender says, these are the people I trust to go out there and determine that the property has been correctly fixed. You get them in on the front end. You get me in on the back end, we're going to go do the process over. We don't have a choice. So the way you handle that, we have water damage. I want my lender, my lender to know we have water damage. So that the fix is certified to the lender's approval prior to it being done. Okay, that's the fix. That's the last house we sold um, on the inspection. They found mold in the attic. Okay. And the mold company came out and determined that it was um, construction mold that had, during construction developed, died and was not a live not mold. Alive. And we, we have that in Utah, lot, very arid. Right. And well, this is in Oregon where. <laughs> well, it's yeah. not very arid. But um, even though the report said it was, it was not live. It was not a. a, a Noxious mold, you know, some molds are dangerous, right. some aren't. Right. We had it remediated anyways, and the lend and because of that, then the lender signed off. But we found out later if they hadn't, they, they wouldn't have even though the certified dead and not a problem. So that was money well right. spent. Yeah, so I guess I guess my point to you is when you deal with specific issues like that, do not hide them from the lender because they're going to be acceptable with the same fix you are. It's just if they come in after the fact, okay, I want to see inside that wall. Well, we fixed it. Sorry. Now, you may get away with that because you hire a remediation crew. It's heavily bonded, insured, and reputable, and they're not going to have an issue. But why take that chance? You know, well, that's what the lender knew. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that would be the fix. Right. Um, yeah, I, I guess my best way to say is, look, if you if you have an issue on that, if you have an issue before you write the addendum, have a good enough relationship with everybody involved and let them know what's going on. Because the fix needs to be approved by all parties. So nonetheless, when you write an addendum, we have to have it. We can't have addendum one, two, three, and it's six, and it doesn't work. Um, the other thing when you write contracts, a lot of people don't realize from a lender standpoint, most of us are writing a contract trying to get it accepted by the seller. And we want to write the shortest term we possibly can. So it's the 30th of month, we say, okay, I want, I'm going to give you 30 days, or it's the 30th of next month. The 30th of next month falls on a Friday or Saturday. Is that wise? Probably not. Me personally, I love when a contract comes in and the settlement date is Thursday. I don't care what day of the month that is. It's Thursday. And the reason why is because on occasion, things happen. And in the state of Utah, unfortunately, we do not, we're not what's considered a wet state. 
in that uh, there are other states that, that mandate that you will fund that deal on the day it closes. We're not one of those states. Now, if we close the deal, generally by one o'clock, we'll get funding out that day. But it's not, it's not by law. We don't have to do it. We just try and do that. But let's say you close on a Friday and something happens in the closing and you don't get the documents back to the lender till two o'clock. They really can't wire anymore. And what did those borrowers think they were doing that weekend? They were moving. And the seller is not going to then. They should not. You do not have insurance coverage to move into that house. You should not let your borrowers move into that house. They have to wait till Monday now. Well, how do they feel about that? People move on weekends. I'm just telling you to be safe. I would not have a closing day and have the other Thursday, Friday, I mean a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I mean Thursdays are your best bets. That way, you know, and we've had this happen. Hey, look, something happened. They didn't get their money in time. We're supposed to close Thursday. Um, we have a settlement on Friday, but or we have a, thir a settlement on Thursday. We can close tomorrow and we'll fund tomorrow. We'll still be in the weekend. I need a one-day extension. Do we have happy sellers? we have a, an annoyance introduced into the transaction? Yes. Just make a look. Don't, don't say 30 days done. Take a look at your calendar because your borrowers, without even telling you, your borrowers are moving on Saturday. Trust me, they're moving on Saturday. Do not put yourself in a position where you can't deliver a key on Friday night. Okay. So you've uh, written the contract, you've properly put your dates in there. Again, you guys have gone through your contingency dates. You have put all those in there. Um, you deliver your contract to the lender. I would highly advise not waiting very long at all. I would send it in an email. I'd make it make you, so that you have an electronic record of when you delivered that contract because that is very important on our end. We're looking at when I go and ask for favors, and we do this all the time, I need a rush. Please help me, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the people in our industry have done this for 30 years. They look at the file and go, okay, who caused the problem here? It's going to be heavily determining how much I'm going to help you. Because if I go back and everything's in my system, and I go back and you, you delivered me a contract on this date and it was the right date, and now you're asking for this, you know what, you, you, you messed up. The lender messed up. So get that in there. You get it in there on time, it gives them a, a tool to use in case they have to draw a favor. So um, I, I don't care if it's Saturday night at 11 o'clock. Scan that thing, get it to your lender. Okay, it's, and from our standpoint, we really appreciate that too because once the contract hits the ground, you know, we've pre-approved them. Pre-approval means nothing. Pre-approvals live and die all the time. When a contract shows up, it's game on. When you send one at Saturday night at 11 o'clock, the message just got sent really clearly to me. This is important. Get on this Monday morning at 8.30. So get it over as quick as you can and follow it up with all the addendums. So contract in hand now. We are going to, uh, we, we did the whole process of pre-approving somebody. What we didn't do was disclose in a guaranteed fashion the cost to borrow money. Now we have told the people the cost to borrow money because they're going to ask. But by law, we don't have to guarantee that until you have a contract in hand. Once we have a contract in hand, we have to do what's called disclosure. It's, it's an LE loan estimate that goes out to the borrower. So we have, once I put that contract in my system, I have three days to deliver those closing costs. And this is a cool thing. You know, regulation is not always a great thing, but this is one of the really great things about what the regulation from the meltdown happened. Is that those closing costs are now guaranteed. And on occasion, you will find on your CD, your closing document, you'll see that the lender made an aggregate adjustment. They don't call it the aggregate adjustment. There's an aggregate's different. They'll show a lender credit for the difference in what those closing costs were disclosed at and what they actually ended up being. We will have to make that back within that tolerance. So this is a really cool thing because when your borrowers, three days after the contract, they receive their loan estimate, those are guaranteed. They cannot change without a material change. Uh, they can change like if, for instance, we pre-qualified you on, say, a particular loan, and all of a sudden now you didn't qualify because some of the information you gave me didn't pan out. Now I have to change you to a different loan program. It's called a change of circumstance. We can change your loan cost because that loan changed its fees, and you no longer qualify like you did before. We have to prove all that. We have to have evidence of that. Um, but that's the only way that that can change. Now, there are fees 
third-party vendor fees, we call them, that are not guaranteed. We have to guarantee our fees. Um, and we have a very small tolerance on title fees. But if you come along and say, you know what, I want to add, it could be a warranty, it could be, uh, you know, I want inspection or whatever, those fees are not guaranteed. Okay, it's the fees that we deliver that we have to guarantee. But with that, we have now delivered that to you. We have three days to deliver it to you. And we have to deliver it, uh, we can do it in person, by mail, or, or, or email. Email is the process we try to do the most because it allows for the quickest turnaround. Um, here again, we're, we're dependent upon very specific guidelines of how we deliver documentation to your borrower. With an email transaction, at the very very start, we have what's called an e-consent, meaning that you agree to contact or to discuss, discuss your loan with me by email. We send one of those out on every single borrower, and every single borrower has to have their own email account in order for us to do that. Sometimes we set them up for a spouse who decides not to have one. Because if we don't do that, now we've introduced a much lengthier process. Um, after three days of me to, of, of you receiving your documentation by email, um, I can immediately order appraisal and title and all that stuff. If you choose not to receive it by email and it's mailed to you, I have to wait seven days. Okay. So we prefer that to do it that way. But once that stuff is in hand, now we're going to order the appraisal. We're going to order the title. Um, we're more than likely, I'm going to just tell you the reality of it. When someone comes in to get pre-approved, we do our very best to, to determine that their income document, that's where we find one of the biggest problems with income. We do our very best to make sure that that's exactly what you have. But the truth of the matter is, you know, that may have been done three months ago. And we have a deal right now, they're trying to get a grant program, just got a raise, and now they don't qualify for the grant. Well, we gave them a pre-approval a month ago, and a month ago, they actually qualified the grant. Now they may make more money than the grant will allow. Those things happen. Um, income documentation grows stale. And if someone has, an, has a, you know, we write these pre-approvals for six months, three months from now, it's not the same approval. Just know that. People's, people go out and spend money. They go out and use their credit. They get their income changes. They, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And the pre-approval mentions, we have four areas in there, don't change these things. Um, in fact, you guys can be really helpful when it comes to credit issues. All the time we'll have someone um, go out and run the credit, you actually qualified by the house, and then they went out and bought something. Oh, we're going to buy a house, so you know what, I saw a really cool sofa I'd like to get. They go out and put a sofa on their credit, and now suddenly they don't qualify. So that's, when we talk about income, that is, credit is the very most important thing that we use to determine whether or not you can buy a house. Number one. Number two is income. That's the number two issue. And the reason why is because there's a thing called debt to income ratio. Um, and those ratios can move all over the board. In fact, you get a little bit of leeway when you get an automated approval. They can actually have income that will exceed normal uh, ceilings. Um, but for the most part, we try and keep those, those under 50%. And some programs actually require that we keep them even under 42%. Uh, we just, FHA just changed, in fact, today is the 19th, so it went into effect yesterday. Uh, FHA used to allow people a lot of leeway on their debt income ratios. We've seen stuff in the upper 50s. Um, they just put out yesterday, they thought that if your income, if your credit is below, I think it's 640, you can no longer exceed 50%. What I want you to get out of this is that what they make, what they spend, we have literally lost deals over $5 before. $5 a month. They literally couldn't pay off any more debt. They could not get any more income. And their debt income ratio was 50.001, and you could not get an approval. $5, they couldn't do it. Well, I'm pretty sure that on the front end when they did the, the pre-approval, they told them, don't mess with this. But people do. Or they get the pre-approval, it takes them three, four months to buy, they forgot, yeah, I put more money on my card, I needed it, we don't have an approval anymore. So that's the number one thing, and now that we have this contract in hand, we're scrambling to go back and verify. I'm just going to tell you the reality. The truth is, you come in three months before you buy, we aren't, we aren't pulling your document every single month. We're not saying, give me a new piece of document. We don't know that you're going to buy. 
we did our very best to get you pre-approved, you may just go away. We can't, we don't have the time to go every paycheck. Hey, give me a new paycheck. Give me a new pay stub. This is the reality of the business. You now have a contract in hand. We're going to go and update that three month old pre-approval. Your income may have changed. And we, that's the number two most important thing. So we now are spending our time verifying those incomes. There's another thing that we have done post our 9-11, the mortgage crisis. Um, this is actually backing off a little bit now. I would say a year ago, every single file had to have what's called a 4506T exercise on them. What that means is you have given the lender authorization to go to the IRS and get a copy of the tax returns. Let me know why. So 10, 15 years ago, and I saw this happen, people, uh, loan officers would have a little copy of TurboTax and you needed to make more money, so they would just create it. Put that in the file, yeah, that's fraud. That's jail type fraud, but people did it. So what they do now is you provide us a, uh, a tax return. Remember I said we do things in triplicate? You provide us a tax return. We're gonna go to the IRS and say, is this the same tax return that they filed? We're seeing a couple of loan programs and they're based upon incredible strength in other areas in a file that maybe you can get around having that 4506 T, but the reality is why wouldn't you want a 4506 T? Now, what time of year would that be an issue? Right now, right now, how busy is the IRS? Incredibly busy. Um, and we also run into the issue where I filed my taxes last week, okay? And now I have to give my lender a 4506 T. Does the IRS have it through their system yet? No. no. So you gotta be really careful about those kinds of issues as well. Um, we're now going to, now that we've handled income, one of the bigger issues is down payment money. Now, this one, the reason why it falls down to third place because it's not as important. Um, certain programs require that you have sufficient down payment money to fit that program, but we have the option to actually use other programs. Say you have, I got $20,000, this happens all the time. We got $20,000 for a down payment. Okay, you got your contract in hand. I have 15,000. We had to spend this. Okay, well, we'll just find a way to make that happen. Um, everybody knows what happens at a 20% down payment ratio. What does that do for you? Mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance. Yeah. What good is mortgage insurance to you? Helps you to buy a house. What good is it the day after you buy your house? No value to you whatsoever. Some people, depending, I'm not an accountant, I'm going to give you account advice. Some people can actually write mortgage insurance off on their taxes. But from a standpoint of once you bought that house, that mortgage insurance is of zero value to you. It's of huge value to the lender. They want to make sure that you, should you lose your house, they will go file a claim against that insurance to cover the loss they will, they will incur on that house. But if you do not have a minimum of 20% down, you will either pay mortgage insurance or you will pay a higher interest rate. Utah Housing has a great loan right now called the No MI. You might have to have a 700 FICO score, and they will there will be no mortgage insurance on it. What you will have is a higher interest rate. Now, is there any reason to choose one or the other? I choose mortgage insurance because once you get below, very good, it drops. We very good. Interest rate stays the whole time. For the most part, that's true. Well, it should be high. And yeah, five years ago, that was 100% true. Um, FHA actually goes through the process of, this is your government spending your money. They just changed mortgage insurance a few years back to life of loan from FHA. So if you do an FHA loan, you will have mortgage insurance for the entire 30 years, where it didn't used to be the case. Conventional, or what we call private mortgage insurance, um, automatically falls off at 78%. You can petition it off at 80%. So once we Does FHA have mortgage insurance if you're below the 80 when you start? Yes. Oh, so they have mortgage insurance for that one. Yes. I would do right now where they're actually going to be the 70% loan to value way behold below. Um, and because I don't want to give you guys, you guys are like sponges. I don't want to overfill you. Um, because an interest rate on an FHA loan doesn't care what your FICO score is. Okay. But they have high mortgage insurance. Whereas on a conventional loan, if you have a 620 FICO score, your interest rate is going to be very, very high, and so is your mortgage insurance. So when someone has a 620 FICO score, it's very, very, very rare that we wouldn't tell them to go FHA. You got a lower FICO, lower credit score. I also tell people this: yes, it is life of the law. It's not the first time that's happened. Uh, Twenty some odd years ago, maybe even longer than that, FHA mortgage insurance was life of the law as well. 
and then it became not life of the law. These things are political issues. They're tied to votes. The government is the one who controls that. And at some point, they're going to come out again and say, you know what, I want to get more votes. Hey, I propose that we eliminate mortgage insurance and go back to you know the 80% and move it out. And it'll pass. It'll happen down the road. So for me, when I tell someone, you have a life loan FHA mortgage insurance, it wasn't always that way. And it probably won't be that way again. But, um, you know, people also have the opportunity to increase their credit scores. We refinance them out of that. They move their life, their mortgage insurance. Mortgage insurance has been very expensive. Very expensive. Just so you guys know kind of how this works. In conventional financing, the mortgage insurance can be a monthly charge. That's all. And, and it'll vary from about a 0.3 factor to uh, maybe a uh, one point. That's just like interest rates, but they call it MI. But if you had a 4%, you had mortgage insurance of 0.5, you have a 4.5 blended ratio rate. FHA has what they call an upfront mortgage insurance. It's 1.75% of the loan. That's a lot of money. That's added to your loan. It does not calculate into your into your loan to value balance, but it does go into the back of the loan. You will pay that off um, through the course of paying off your loan. And then they will add to that, depending on which kind of loan it is, but for the most part, it's a 0.85 factor. That's like adding 0.85 to your interest rate. That's what it looks like. But sometimes with someone with 625 FICO score, their best their best loan program is FHA. So um, there are, like I say, there are a lot of ways that we can actually deal with that. But I think it was you brought it up, a really good point. We could get out of it, whereas opposed to if you do a, a, a an elevated interest rate to compensate for no MI, when does that interest rate go down? It doesn't. But there are some cases where that works. How long does most people stay in their house? Seven years. Seven years. Yeah. So we like to also tell people that. And that will actually go into the loan program they look at. What's the average loan program? 30 years. If you know for a fact you're not going to be in your house 30 years, why would you go with a 30 year rate? There are what called uh, there are blended programs. It means that it's fixed for a period of time, then it will then it will go to an adjustable rate. That fixed period is lower than a 30-year rate. You're 100% positive you're going to be in that house five years. Why wouldn't you do that? So those are some options that you can take a look at. They also, as you become aware of these things, you transcend from the salesperson to the consultant, which is what you want to do. You want to make sure that your client gets the very best. The argument we get most in lending, what's our product? It's money. What color is my money compared to the money down the street? It's the same color. So how am I different? And how are you different? You're selling the same house someone down the, house, down the street is selling. The only way you're different is in the professionalism that you bring to that transaction. If you're a consultant instead of a salesperson, you've separated yourself from the field. Otherwise, they'll go somewhere else. They don't need to use you. You're just, you're just a commodity. So that's how we try to, yes? Sorry, I have a question. No, I love it. Um, the mortgage insurance, are yes. there any other types of like fees that can go along like if, like there's a flood zone or something like that that really requires yes. like flood insurance or like um, other kind of so flood insurance is 100 percent that's that's actually um it's it's i don't know if i should use this word but it would be a little irresponsible for a person to take a listing and not realize that the house was in a flood zone i, I mean i hate to say that because i hope none of you have done that but and maybe that was a learning experience if you take a listing and you've not determined that that's in a flood zone, um, you've probably done your sellers a disservice. Well, we didn't know it was a flood zone, and now we're under contract. And now we have to get flood insurance, so... It's expensive. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a little dinky house, but we're spending almost two grand a month with the mortgage insurance and then the flood insurance. And then the, so. That should it's affect the value of the house. Yeah. Right. Um, and you know, you know how floodplains work. If any time within the last hundred years, a flood has actually encroached upon that property, and it doesn't have to. Uh, um, there's a lot of rules, but it, it really, for the most part, needs to reach the house. But those floodplains are, are and that's not exactly the case always. But um, it's very easy to check that um, floodplain. But the lenders require it, right? Oh, we have to. 100%. We have to do a flood point. Is this flooding or other natural disasters? No, there, there's, I mean, if you're in a fault line, we don't. 
we don't care about that. Well, when insurance companies are also changing, like State Farm, I know if your if your foundation is within a certain distance to a creek, a river, anything, they will, they're stopping insuring those homes, even if it's not in a floodplain. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's uh, with some of the natural disasters we've had lately. The insurance companies are getting a little skittish, so you'll see some of that stuff. Um, in some cases, you might be able to find another insurance company to get around that. But from floodplain, um, yeah, that's a big deal. And like I say, if you're out taking a listing and you you have reason to believe that's in a floodplain, that affects the the value of the house. I mean, it really does. If I have to spend three hundred dollars more a month for that. Then that comes off the value. I mean, I'll buy it, but three hundred dollars less a month—that's a lot of money. So, you know, generally people know they're within a floodplain. I think within the last couple of years, we had um, an area up north that got added to floodplain. But for the most part, within a hundred years, you know where the floods are. That's why they do a hundred years. So, but yeah, you need to be aware. What's, the floods are like, do we have so to that? we have to pay to have that searched. Now we go through the same company that pulls our credit. They will also pull floodplains for us. Um, you may be able to get that information from a county recorder's office. I know that for for uh, efficiency, quickness, we actually it's ten bucks. We pay we pay our credit reporting agency and they pull the floodplain for us and they give us a cert certificate that we have to provide to the aggregator that's why we use a service i think you can go down to the county recorders and find that yeah. well sometimes free. too like we had a house we sold where it kind of sat on a hill and it dropped so part of the property was in a floodplain but the house had never so we had a survey done and they were able to all the houses on that street we were able to pull out of the floodplain even though yes. the lower property was in the floodplain seen so that happen many times you can have surveys done to pull the house out of the floodplain. yeah yeah um, that's a little bit of work, but if you have a house, yeah, it costs like thirty-five hundred dollars to do, but it made it a sellable house. Yeah, it's a sellable house now because yeah. without that, I mean, three hundred bucks a month. I don't even know what that calculates to, but the value that takes out of your house at three hundred dollars that you would have attributed to principal and interest, it's a significant amount of money, and that's what your house went down. So yes, you can actually. I've seen that done many times. Like I said, it's a large piece of property with a slope on the back that back pace may have flooded. They don't. They don't really care. It's the house they're looking for. Um, any other questions on that kind of stuff? Okay, we've actually, we're moving along the, the verification process. We're actually going to order a, 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 we are going to order title report. That has been done previously because when you guys take a listing, you're going to have a search done on the title. Make sure that the sellers can actually sell that house and how much money is owed on it. So it's actually going to be a viable transaction. We're going to have an updated title report that's going to be provided for us. That title report now is going to include searches on uh, what you guys don't do this when you guys do uh, your search to do a listing. We're going to do a judgment search on every per every person involved in the transaction because those judgments can sometimes cloud the title and actually prevent the sale from going through. So we want to know that as soon as we possibly can. There have been some changes done, and I'm not exactly sure why they did this. Well, I guess it's actually helpful from a, a consumer standpoint um, that passed legislation that took some judgments and collection accounts right off your credit report. All that stuff used to pull up right on your credit report. Now it doesn't. It's caused a lot of grief for us. The reason why they did that is because they felt like that was inhibiting consumers' ability to go out and buy jewelry cars, whatever they wanted to buy. Um, for us now, it can be a false positive because I pull your credit report and I don't see any judgments or liens on there. You go, oh, they're fine. And the title pulls it and there they are. That introduces one more service that we have to now uh, research to make sure that we don't have anything that's going to cloud the process. So not only are we doing flood cert, we're doing fraud guard, we're doing we're doing searches for collections. Uh, the cost of doing a loan, they've actually, I read something just this morning, the cost on doing a loan tripled in the last five years. The, the administrative cost of doing a loan has tripled. And it's, it's the same thing that medicine has gone through. Now we're going to have you do everything with tests to make sure you can't sue us. Same thing here. The industry got sued a lot. You guys know that. They got sued a lot in the last 10 years. So they're going to do everything they can on the front end now. And that cost passed on to the client. And then we can do about it. But those are the things that, the reason why you should be aware of that is because any one of those searches could, could, could potentially bring something up that we didn't know before. 
So we gave you guys a pre-approval letter, and you guys went, oh, good, they're pre-approved. We didn't pull a flood guard. We didn't pull a fraud guard. We didn't pull, we didn't pull the judgment search. We didn't do any of those things. They're a cost. And we're assuming, because on an application, we're asking them explicitly. They'd be adding judgments, collections, bankruptcies, uh, repossessions. We're going by their word. That, I, that's the unfortunate reality of this industry. A lot of that stuff, we're going by the word until we get a contract in hand. And if they lie to us, and we, we really try and stress, please be upfront with this, because it's going to come out. But if it'll come out, get in the contract process, and find it didn't work. Okay, so now we've uh, we've verified all of those things. We've actually now we've ordered an appraisal, um, and the appraiser is generally they're taking about five to seven days now to get an appraisal done. Hopefully, the CMA that was done at the time of the listing will be a very conscientious, responsible CMA, so that we know that that's actually going to going to come through and bear out the appraisal. Um, what's the worst appraisal to get right now? Anybody know? VA. It's the worst appraisal to get. Several years ago, in an effort to keep us from influencing the appraised value, because lenders were doing that, real estate agents were doing that, hey, bring my appraisal in higher, they created what's called an AMC, it's an appraisal management company. And that appraisal management company exists to separate the appraisers from us, and I'm including you guys in this. They do not want us talking to the appraiser at all. We can talk to the appraisal management company, and they can exert their influence, whatever, on the value of the property, but, but we cannot. Now, FHA appraisals, conventional appraisals, fall under an appraisal management company. A VA appraisal does not fall under an appraisal management company. It falls under VA. So we get a VA appraisal. We call the VA Veterans Administration. We send out one of your appraisers. They work for the VA. They do not work for me. People who are in my pool of the AMCs do work for me because I can remove them from my pool. And if they do really rotten appraisals, we're not even on the pool anymore. VA appraiser, they don't care. They just literally don't care. They're being paid no matter what. You have to pay them by law. They go out and do the appraisal. I have to pay them. So they go out and you sold the house and then you know the market. And you know what? There were 10 offers on it. You sold it for $400,000. VA appraiser goes out and says, no, nah, I think it's three seventy-five. dollars Now what? I have to tell you, we're seeing a lot of uh, listing agents saying, you know, uh, we're not sure we'll take a VA offer on this. It, they can run it. I, I, I don't know. This is on you guys. Then. I don't know if you're running into problems by not by saying you can't do a VA because there may be discrimination issues there. But I can assure you when the offer comes in and they're looking at a conventional or an FHA or a VA, they're going to take that one. And the sad thing about it is probably the best loan for a borrower that there is is a VA loan. It's an amazing loan. An amazing loan. They don't have mortgage insurance. I mean, they have, a, they have a funding fee, but they don't have a monthly fee to cover a 100% loan. In fact, that loan doesn't even have to be 100%. At closing, we can take that 100% purchase and add to that some of their consumer debt. It is an amazing loan. I love VAs. In a seller's market, it's not a great loan because your sellers are trying to get the very most they can out of their property. And the VA appraiser says, I don't care what you think that property is worth. And you don't have, you have a problem with it? What do you want me to do about it? Sometimes the, that's good to have the seller when the appraiser comes. Yes. Because they can talk to the appraiser they can talk and influence to. however they want to. I, I will tell you, though, the economic influence that they can exert is zero. Whereas, um, you know, a, a person who's in my pool, if they want to continue to do appraisals for me, they have to make that appraisal work. You know, if you guys go out and have fight 10 offers to sell a house, quite frankly, that's what the house is worth. If there were 10 offers with $400,000, guess what? The house is worth $400,000. VA appraiser comes in and says we're three seventy-five. dollars you know. Conventional appraiser comes out and says three ninety-eight. dollars Guess what I'm going to say? I'm not going to call the appraiser. I'm going to call the appraisal management company. That's less than 1%. This happens. That's less than 1%. And I need that 1% or my client's going to lose it still. So you find another comp and make it work. Or I go to the real estate and say, find me some comps. You guys have access to things that maybe the appraiser doesn't. Let's fight this appraisal value and get it up there. When someone comes in with a value of 1% or less, that's a margin of error. I know a lot of real estate agents will do that appraisal packet. And I've seen a lot of people do that. And I've seen a lot of people do that. 
yeah. beforehand and yes. leave it there at the yes. home. Yes. Just to kind of verify when they got their price. Yeah, and I don't have much patience for an appraiser who's offended by that. Yeah. You helped him out, so yeah. you get offended by that. Yeah. But what you've done is, is provided them with comps that you feel are relevant to this appraisal, and you've helped him do his job. Right. Now all he has to do is go back to the MLS, he has access to that, and pulls up that code, yeah, that's, that's actually a good comp, good job, way to do your job. So I agree with that totally. And it's not undue influence, you didn't actually talk to him. Um, I do know real estate agents that do talk to the appraisers. We cannot, and I, I don't know your rules, but I think the same applies. But but that kind of stuff, I think, is responsible um, selling. You know, let them know that there are actually values out there. Because this does happen. We get the appraisal back a week. Um, as you can probably tell, we're now getting within 10 to 14 days of closing, and that appraised value comes back. Remember, we're sometimes, and this will happen, we'll ask for an extension on the contingency. Um, it's not an extension on the settlement, but it's on the contingency because money went hard on, say, the 14th, and my appraisal will be back the 14th or the 15th. I don't want that money to go hard without knowing what the appraisal is. So, Does the appraisal know the, uh, the price being offered, the first price? 100%. Okay. Yeah, we have to provide them. We cannot order an appraisal without um, without the, the rep seat okay. in tow. Um, so we will give them that. And the reason why they also have to have that is because... Um, you can look at an appraised value as having hard costs and soft costs. You know what the soft costs are of appraised value? Seller paid closing costs. That's kind of a little margin that they allow to exist in there as long as the comps substantiate that. The $400,000 house you went out and you want your borrowers to receive $6,000 in seller paid closing costs to help them put all their money down towards down payment. Um, so now the house is going to sell for $406,000. Well, so the appraiser has to know that because, because that's a relevant piece of the, of, of the value of that house. So they have to have that contract in hand. So they're going to, how much time we've got? It's still okay. Um, the appraisal's being done. Shouldn't be a whole lot of issues in that. We do on occasion have appraisals come back and say it's a conventional appraisal. And we actually, we did all we could to increase the value, but we're still $5,000 short. At that point, you're actually going to take the appraisal back and say to the seller, what can we do? Um, sometimes it's a pretty good tool. Some people will try to use that, trying to influence an appraisal down. So they can try and use that to try and negotiate the value with the, the seller. And the seller's market does work real well. Um, they'll just say, fine, we'll just go get somewhere else. Um, but those things do happen. So we now have the appraisal in hand. One thing that we're going to look in there is that um, the value came in according to what the contract was. We're also going to look for a little feature called as is, meaning that the appraiser was fine with the value, with the, with the condition of the property. They have two uh, scales that they actually do. It's, it's C1 through 5 and Q1 through 5. One is condition, one is quality. Um, and one being the best, and if you start getting below a three on those areas, the underwriter is going to have an issue with that kind of stuff because the quality and condition of the property are very relevant to the value. Um, but the as-is condition mostly deals with, uh, and FHA can be a little bit harder about this, FHA as a government industry feels like they have an obligation to their borrowers to make sure that the property is safe, usable, functional. So they may come out, and they're notorious for this. Most of you who have sold houses, you'll have paint jobs that need to be done on an FHA property. You know, paint the eaves or a wall or a door. They may be handle their uh, screens and windows, uh, uh, floor, railings on store on uh, stairways. Uh, in fact, even in your Rep C, it has a spot in there that says we will allow up to X amount of dollars to fix issues. And most people put standard five hundred dollars in there. On an FHA appraisal, and even on a conventional, you'll see a lot of times they'll say, we have issues, they need to be fixed. And this kind of brings back what we talked about at the beginning of the class. When you have those issues that need to be fixed, of course, the lender is going to be one telling you, do not. And a lender may forget to be in the middle of this because that work will be certified by someone approved by the lender because we have a legal obligation. It's not being arrogant, it's not trying to control the process. We have a legal obligation. Being they, in most cases, being the biggest pocketbook in the transaction, the lender is the one who's going to get sued the most. 
they're going to make sure that when someone warned the borrower, the buyer, that there's a problem with the house, they're going to make sure that that problem is rectified and done by a certified bonded insured uh, professional. So when someone comes back, if your lender comes back and says, we have these issues, get them fixed, and he doesn't say who's going to do it and what kind of certifications we're going to have, be very careful. At the very least, the appraiser's going to have to go back out because the appraiser is the one who said, I have a problem with that paint. The appraiser has to go back out and say, I don't have a problem anymore. It can't be anybody else. The appraiser's the one that brought the problem. He's got to fix it. We're going to have to pay for that reinspection fee. It can be 150 bucks. 75 to 100 depends how far he has to travel. So just make sure that when you see, and, and this will happen a lot, this is very common that there are issues on properties that have to be, that have to be addressed. So that's an issue that this can create, this can create delays because they can actually ask for things to be fixed that are very material to the, I mean, this could be, you know, I had uh, one house that, I don't know how this got past the builder, but the, the street sloped to the house. Okay, that's a big deal. And to fix that was a big deal. And it actually took a couple weeks and there had to be an extension on the property. So be aware of what that fix is and what kind of time lines you're on. And also be aware that if it's a little paint job, it's probably gonna be very difficult to get a professional out there to do it. It may be the homeowner. I've seen real estate agents do it. I've seen lenders do it. It just needs to be to the satisfaction of the appraiser. So just be careful on those kinds of things. So we've now gathered all this documentation together. We have actually had, we've had most cases a loan officer involved with the process of gathering. We've now had a processor who's been gathering this documentation. And hopefully all of them understand what it is that the underwriter is looking for. But in most cases, you write a 30 day contract, the underwriter probably doesn't see that until week three or later. That can be a little scary, right? Because a week four, you're closing. Week three, this person, and this happens regularly. And this is why you're, you don't want to use someone who doesn't have a lot of experience because they may have forgotten just one little thing, one little item in an underwrite, and they didn't see that, but everything else looks really strong. It suddenly gets in front of an underwriter. You're now three weeks in, and the underwriter says, uh, this doesn't work. You now have a week to close, and your loan officer and processor weren't experienced enough to recognize that this was going to stop the transaction. So now we've got a week to fix it. And the only reason that thing came about was because they didn't understand that it should have gone in a different program on day one. And you wouldn't have even had that problem. And they'll try and explain that as, oh, they didn't do this. And nobody's going to take the blame themselves. But in many cases, it was the lack of experience that set this on the wrong path from day one. It's why you, as a real estate professional, are going to want to, going to, want to develop a relationship with someone who has a proven track record. Because trust me, with as much information as exists within this within a transaction, it is very, very easy to miss something. Very easy. I mean, a loan program might require 30 different, different items to qualify for that. And what a trained person will do will recognize, having a lot of experience, recognize what's necessary and recognize what they don't know and immediately get that in front of an underwriter, which that happens all the time. But in the normal course of processing the loans, the underwriter probably doesn't see it till, till the third start of the third week. Remember, we're closing at the end of the fourth week. This, it may not look like it from where you guys sit, but this is, this is a firestorm behind the scenes a lot of times. We're really, um, you know, we have to deliver files within 30 days or you guys don't get offers purchased. And 30 days in some cases is not enough time. And we're really scrambling to make things work. So you need to have someone who knows how to navigate those things. But we submit that to the underwriter. An underwrite, we have posted to us on a regular basis how long an underwriting pr uh, process takes when you're really swamped. It can get up to 72 hours. We really like to see them at 24 to 48. And if you're running efficiently, that's the kind of time that's necessary to underwrite. But, you know, sometimes, you know, you'll see a boom in, in, the, in the selling market. It just happens like that. And we weren't prepared. The industry wasn't prepared. There's enough for underwriters, processors, and support staff. All of a sudden, underwriting can go to a long period of time. This does happen. Hopefully, you're being warned about that. Um, but we like to see, you know, the 24 to 48 hours. What happens is they take the file and they give, they give their initial purview of the file. Um, I can only think of one time in 
in my entire career where they came back and said, okay, good, close it. There are always conditions. So they'll come back and say, I have questions about this, I have questions about that. Please fill in the gaps for me. The reasons why this is more of an art form than a science is because they have standards and rules and regulations that are, that are given to us and they're updated every quarter. That's what people like to see. It's like a law. Like Congress writes a law, but the judges determine how to, how to read it. Same thing with us. The underwriter determines how to read that. And the reason why they change their determination is because we underwrite a file, we fund it, then we send it off to the ultimate servicer of that file. Then they look at it and go, I don't like this. Well, we've already funded it. This happens on 10 to 20 percent of our files. That the ultimate aggregator of the loan sends it back to us and says it's not, it's not good enough. And we are behind the scenes scrambling. Now, for the most part, it doesn't involve the borrower. They don't have to get back involved, but occasionally it does. But because of those, uh, what we call deficiencies, the underwriter gets very, very adept at figuring out what needs to be in that file. So even though we, go and we processed it according to the guidelines, they came back and said, no, this doesn't work. Now the underwriter is the person who says, before we sell it, before we fund it, I got to have this fixed. An underwriter has a delegation that is given to them. Um, if it's an FHA or a VA delegation, it comes from the government itself. If it's a conventional delegation, it comes from the employer. That delegation says that we certify you to underwrite things. They can lose that delegation. They can become blackballed. And a person who makes six figures a year doesn't want to lose that job. And that's why you'll see pushback from underwriters. They literally can lose their job because they actually process or accepted a loan that went through to the aggregator, the aggregator kicked it back to us. And now, and this happens all the time. Us as a lender, we now own that house. That's a big hit. That's a big hit. And we buy five to 10 of them a year. That's the cost of doing business, like theft in a store. We're gonna buy back deals. But if you don't, any lender who's not buying houses um, is not aggressive enough. They're just, they're not on the edge of buying what's acceptable. It's a cost of doing business. Eventually you refinance them out of the house, but they default, you sell it, you don't lose all your money. So does the borrower generally know you've done that or is that no. after the fact? Okay. No, they don't know generally. Um, we've, for the most part, we've over-processed the file, gathered as much documentation we have as we can, and then we put in the file to the underwriter what we, we don't want to over-present because you can sometimes introduce a situation we didn't want them to know. And so sometimes we'll have that in here or it's things that we can fix with the title company. A majority of the time the borrower never knows that's happening. On our end, I, the reason I tell it to you is it helps us understand what the process of underwriting looks like. And so we what change percentage the percentage of those end up defaulting? Um, you mean in that so we buy it back uh -huh. or the borrower never makes a payment? No, where you buy it uh, Like I said, it's, uh, you know, we did uh, uh, last year, we did just under 10,000 transactions and probably bought five or 10. Okay. So it's not huge, it's, it's cost of doing business. Okay. But that's not a borrower default. No, that's not a borrower okay. default. No, that's not a borrower default. That's a deficiency in the, in the, the strength of the file. So they bring it, come back to us 24, 48 hours later. We now have conditions that we have to gather quickly. Remember, we're in this last week and it's crunch time. We have to gather those, those conditions quickly. And you may need to be involved in that process at that point because the borrowers are kind of like, hey, I gave you all this stuff. How come you're asking me for more? That's what the deal looks like. It's just how it works. Underwriters don't look at the file when you give them a contract. The system just doesn't work that way. They see it after you do all your work and now we're in crunch time. And they're going to come back to you and go, my, my lender is incompetent. I don't know why we're three weeks into this and now they're asking me for this. That's why. You do the very best you can, but uh, this is not a sales job for me or my company. This is the industry. It's how it works. You cannot afford to have a person making six figures a year look at every single contract the day it comes in. You can't afford to do that. They're working full time on the back end. So, what are the things that catch that at that point? That hadn't been before. Um, well, there are a lot of things that, that really aren't justifiable. Like we should have caught that there was a $5,000 deposit in the bank account and we didn't see it. Um, or that the money that they, the down payment money they received from a source, it was questionable where it came from, but we're like, what, what do we got to do? We got to take a roll of dice. 
Uh, we send it in there, and they're like, yeah, we'll accept it if you do this. Most people, when they buy a house, they don't just, we don't plug them into a square hole. Right. They are like, it's an art form. I'm trying to paint a very uh, a picture of this person as being a responsible homeowner, that it's not going to be in default three months from now. But it's so rare that we go, guideline fits. Guideline fits. It just right. doesn't happen that way. So we're trying to present Boy, you're a good loan officer too. The underwriters hate their guts because they will argue and argue. they learn the, the guidelines and they'll say, yeah, but this, 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 this. And the underwriters fighting back, trying to go, well, I'm just trying to save my job. Right. They're the only one whose job is on the line. None of us get fired if a, if a deal get, gets bought back. Loan officer doesn't get fired. The underwriter does. So that's the way it's supposed to be. So anyway, there's no way this has been going on for 70 years. There's no way to change that. The under eye is going to see it in the third week. And then all of a sudden they come back with changes and you got to work on them. So when your buyers come back and say, I cannot believe this happened, bring your can of water. Tell them, unfortunately, how things work. But we're going to get you to the closing line. We're going to make it happen. What can I do to help you? Let's find out what they need. Let's make it happen. Because sometimes a realtor can help too. That's just the way it works. That isn't necessarily that you have a bad loan house. It's just the way it works. Um, so you meet those, you grab those conditions, you get those back in front of an underwriter. They're going to tell us 24 hours to review that. Remember, they're not sitting around waiting for your file to show back up. We're utilizing them to the best of our ability. They're working full time, sometimes working overtime. You're going to see 24 hours to review those conditions. At that point, hopefully we met everything. I've seen them come in and out of underwriting three, four times. Um, so what we've done at this point, we now, once it comes back out of there, we have what's called a clear close. Okay, that's the magic formula. Clear or close or ready to close. It does have to go through a QC just to re-verify that all the documentation is in place. But with that clear to close, we can order closing documents, which is the CD. That's what it stands for. There is something called an early CD. Do you guys know what that is? Part of the new legislation that said that the borrower needs to be completely aware of all of the relevant information to a transaction. It used to be, prior to about five years ago, that your buyer could show up at a closing table and be surprised by closing costs, interest rates, anything. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, you don't have any choice. You can buy the house or not. It happened a lot. And that's a really good thing about the new legislation is that you cannot surprise a borrower anymore. And they got surprised all the time by unscrupulous lenders that just surprised, you know. We knew lenders, loan officers, who wouldn't go to closing and expect the title agent to disclose the new interest rate and the, and the closing cost. Very cowardly way of doing business, and I love what they've done with this. So three days prior to closing, and this is regulated and cannot be changed, we send out what's called an early CD. That early CD will have, there can be some changes to that CD, but for the most part, all of the relevant information, down payment money, interest rate, those kinds of things are in that early CD, and your borrower has three days to review that. And they can change their mind at any time during that point. Now, those three days are very important. Let's say that we talked about your closing being happening on uh, Thursday. We have to get that document out on Monday. And they have to open it and acknowledge it before midnight. And that's very important. If they do not, you're not closing on Thursday. It's that simple. Now, can you still go to settlement and sign and not fund? Or can you not nope. even go to settlement? Okay. Nope. And the reason why they've done that is because they have given a thing called safe harbor that came out of the mortgage crisis. If, as a lender, I follow these steps that they have outlined, I have a safe harbor. You cannot sue me. So one of those safe harbors is I did not sign prematurely. Okay. So you will not find a lender who will. Technically, there's called, I can't remember what, the, I've never seen it done, but there's a, a stipulation that's attached to an emergency. I can't possibly wait three days. I've got something. And you're supposedly able to file some kind of a, you know, acceleration form. I've never seen it done, ever. But supposedly, legislature wrote that in there. But do not plan on that, because I just don't see it happening. So have to acknowledge that three days, OK? And then you can close. So you go into closing. Um, all the documentation should be there because you reviewed it prior to actually closing. Um, in the state of Utah, this may change. 
Uh, right now we have a lot of what's called split closing. Uh, that means that it's, it's kind of um, an unwritten rule in your industry that the person who listed the property will guide and direct the title work. Meaning that they have a title agent they really trust and love and maybe they're getting a lot of lunch about them. I don't know what it is, but they say, this is the person who's going to close it. In the state of Utah, we have a lot of split closings because you as a buyer's agent would say, no, we're not going to close there. I'm going to close here. We're fine doing that. Some states don't allow that. You may actually see that change here. You may see them come along at some point and say, we're not doing split closings. I will tell you split closings introduce an additional layer of delay um, because those two title companies have to talk to each other. They have to get documentation to each other in order to fund. Um, if they do split, you know, we like to see the seller close the day before so that the seller's title company can get the documentation to the buyer's title company. So when the buyers sign, they take all that documentation and get it over to the lender so they can fund that day. But you will see split closings. It's the way it is. I don't love it, but it is what it is. Um, nonetheless, if they sign early enough in the day, uh, we will table fund, meaning that we've sent the funds with the documents to the title company. And they will send the documentation back to us. We will check that to make sure that all signatures done, the dates are right, that we have missed, not missed any documentation. Um, a lot of times, people have waited till that day to transfer their money to the title company. We have to have documentation of that transfer, which can be a little bit lengthy. Some borrowers don't want to do it till that day, but it can delay the process. So those are some of the things we're waiting on. Once all those things happen, which by the way, you guys get this hammered to you, but. On our end especially, uh, when someone comes to me and says, okay, what, is it, what are the wiring instructions? I give them the name of the title company and they can call them. Because you guys know about the fraud that's involved with misdirection of, of, of uh, down payment monies. I would recommend too that you may sometimes feel like you want to be the person who knows things and gets the middle of it. Well, here's your title wire instructions. I can get them for you. Don't ever introduce yourself in, in that process because if they ever lost their money, you have a protection in saying, talk to the title company and talk to me. But once they get all that, that information in the file, they will now uh, give authorization to record. Once they record, they will deliver checks and keys and the whole works. They can now record electronically. You just have to go down and stand in line at the county recorder's office. It was a mess. And then you guys have done this for a while. Automation has been so incredible. Literally, they can do it. It actually gave them a little bit longer time to record too. They can actually go until 10 to 5 sometimes. Whereas before, if you didn't have someone with the D note down there to stand in line at the county recorder's office at 4 o'clock, it wasn't going to happen. Once it's recorded, a responsible real estate agent will never allow for ownership, possession, even to walk into the house until that thing records. This, this just introduces too much uncertainty. There can be legal issues that arise, but once it's recorded, and you'll be notified by the lenders recorded, you can now deliver keys, stand in line for your checks, the whole works. Even though that has happened, now we go back to what we talked about on our end, we will still, and, and part, of, part of the process of uh, closing a transaction is a document called errors and omissions. And the title, the title agent will have the borrower sign an errors and omissions form stating that minor clerical, er, clerical errors can be corrected by the lender, title, whoever. And in a lot of cases, though, that form is used to fix minor things. You can't change the integrity of the loan, but they can fix minor things. We will on occasion have items that don't fall within the errors and omissions, and we will have to um, involve some of the players in it. And I can assure you we do everything we can not to because... Boy, there's an interesting thing in sales, and you guys will learn this really well, that when money changes hands, all motivation to do anything is gone. Sometimes people get angry about the requirements that we as lenders make, for instance, on new homes and such. Um, we have to, you know, a certificate of occupancy has to be in place with all the work that being, that's required. We don't ever let the builder go, you know, I'm good for that. I mean, I'm a, no, no, no. Once money changes hands, nobody has motivation to do anything. So it would be, you would do well to live by the same, and when you see people doing that, it may seem like a major inconvenience to you, but it is a protection against lawsuits because it never fails to happen. When, when things, money changes hands, everybody's done, even in our end. 
we will on occasion, if you have a very reputable loan officer, they um, will get some favors. Like, I will provide that document to you after closing. Please let me close. And if they have a great relationship with an underwriter, they can get away with it. And they burn them once and they're done. So they know not to do that. Um, is there any other questions? I have one other thing I'm going to bring up. Now I just slipped my mind. Any questions on any of this stuff? I've given you a lot of information. Probably too much. You know, if we took an hour and a half. I spent 25 years learning it, so I don't expect you guys to, to know this. I think the most important thing that I, I would carry away from this is that there is a nonchalance at times about, and this, I'm a branch manager. I'm not looking for business. I'm going to tell you how it is straight. Um, you really need to have a good, strong relationship. In fact, we call them partnerships with your lender um, because there will be problems. If you do 10 files, one of them will blow up. Three or four of them will have heartburn. And the way that the way that I look at a lender, one, they've got to be competent and know what they're doing. You know, make sure that the process happens. But when something goes wrong, what do they do? This person who you've developed as your partner has to be willing to step up and say, I'm going to make it right. As a real estate professional, um, my dad was a broker for 55 years. He had very few transactions in which he didn't take money out of his pocket at the end. That's the reality. And you know what? It's, it's the marketing expense. I'm going to buy you a water heater or there was something wrong with it. whatever it is. You need a lawnmower. Your lender should have the same the same belief as you do. Look, there's someone not happy about it. Many times you can fix it by just putting a little bit of money on it. It's unfortunate reality. And if you have an unhappy client and your lender doesn't care, what does that make you look like? Especially if you said, this is my partner. I recommend them. I endorse them. And at the end of the thing, they made you look bad? No. We tell our loan officers that if there's a grenade on the ground, you got to fall on it. Because that real estate agent is the person who drives your business. They're bringing the client to your door. And if someone has to look bad on it, it's you. So you take the fall because they're going to continue to send you business. Yeah, if something went wrong, there's nothing we can do about it now. That borrower may never send you another deal, but that real estate agent may send you 10 the next year. You take the fall. That's how, if I were a real estate agent looking for someone who I wanted to take care of me, I'm going to look at what do you do when things get bad. How are you going to make me look good? Because if you don't make me look good, I'm going to find somebody who does. I'm the person who's going to make you money. You better make me look good. So just make sure that you, it, it's going to take a while to figure out. You're probably going to stub your toe a few times. You're going to end up with a lender and go, oh, I'll never use that person again. When you find someone good and they make you their partner, become their partner in finding resolution. If you become their adversary, they will not work with you. It's the amazing thing about that top 20% does 80% of the business. We all have this feeling that the real estate agent is, you know, the captain of the ship, they're the person that hires the lender, blah, you know, that's true. But when you're in that 20% and you're doing a lot of business, they'll fire real estate agents too, just like you guys fire loan officers. Become a part of the solution and you'll be you'll develop a relationship with a good lender. Become a part, make it difficult for them. You'll, it was so funny, years ago, no, not that long ago, four or five years ago. Uh, a guy lived by me. I didn't know he was a real estate agent. Then I'd known him for a while. And we got in a situation, sitting down talking, and, and I said, what do you do? He says, real estate agent. He says, what are you going to sell a mortgage on? And he goes, oh, you guys are the worst. I mean, I, I was shocked by this because we're family friends and stuff. You guys are the worst. I went, why do you say that? Well, you don't know what's going on with the deal. You can't anticipate anything. You don't know. It just goes down through this list. And it really bothered me. As it would, you know, if you're attacked, I thought, think about it. I thought, I went and did a little bit of checking. As you guys well know, you can't do this in our industry, but can you tell how many houses someone sells? Pretty simple, right? You can go do that search in about two seconds. So I had a friend search that. How many houses he sold? He sold two houses the last year. I went, okay, who is he doing his business with? He doesn't have a lending partner. And yes, everything he said about the people he did business with was true. They can't pre they can't predict. They can't follow through. They don't make you look like a partner because they are in the bottom percentile of the lenders. You don't want to do business with those people. You want to do business with the people who are at the top end, but 
way you do that is become a partner and a, a partner in resolution. That's the way it works. So, any other questions? I think we're uh, no, we're close. Any questions? Any concerns? Like I say, you know, sometimes it's hard to find um, unbiased answers. You're more than welcome to call me at any time. Um, I'm not going to try and sell you, take you away. If you just literally have a question, you go, look, can I trust this? Is this really the way it works? Am I being bamboozled? Someone like, glad to help you out. Um, I bring a card, leave it Russ. Russ knows how to get them. Glad to help you out at any time. And we do that all the time, help people out. Because sometimes you need a trusted source that's not got a motive. I just want to know the answer. Glad to help you out. Hope you guys all have great careers. It's an amazing business. It's an amazing business. Who can go into a business without startup costs? How do you do that? And once you once you develop your business, it's your business. You decide to move your business somewhere else, you just move it. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing business. Just, just work hard. Just work hard. You gotta move your feet. You'd be surprised just showing up. They always say what I say, 80% of just showing up. People are just looking for reliability. It's someone who's gonna be there. Just show up. Things will be good. Okay, anything else? Okay. Do you have any questions? Class is just this early. Yeah, um, do you know 